All right. Well, I want to be super respectful of our panelists' time. Um, and we have a variety of amazing panelists on the call today. Uh, so I want to go ahead and get started. And as I see people logging in, which I, I keep seeing, I'll continue to uh, accept more people. So this is great. Uh, welcome, everyone. Happy Friday. I think we'll officially go ahead and get started. My name is Patty Woods, and I'm a career counselor in the Lazarus Center for Career Development. I'm also a proud Smith alum. And my colleague, Kate Traskis, and I have the pleasure of moderating quite an accomplished group of Smith College alumni on our Zoom meeting today. And we are very much looking forward to hearing their strategies and advice for job searching during turbulent times. So before we begin, I just uh, like to go over a little bit of housekeeping um, and we'll request that you each keep your video and audio disabled throughout the meeting. And the best way to view this panel is by choosing the speaker view on your Zoom screen to avoid all those little uh, Brady Bunch boxes popping up. And in terms of the format for this one hour meeting, I'll be asking the panelists questions and then we'll open up the Zoom meeting to your questions. Therefore, as questions pop up for you throughout this time, feel free to go ahead and put them in the chat box at any time throughout the panel. Um, if you would like to remain anonymous, send a private message to Kate Traskis and Kate's gonna do her best to, hi Kate, can you hear us? Or can you hear me? <laughs> All right, you're there. Um, Kate will do her best to relay those messages to the, uh, the panelists towards the end of the Zoom call today. Um, last but not least, the uh, Zoom meeting is being recorded and we invite you to stay on this Zoom call at uh, one o'clock when, uh, when the webinar will officially end um, and it will stop being recorded and we invite you to informally chat with a few of the panelists for a few minutes. And at that time, you can take yourself off mute and share your screen just to um, connect. So uh, uh, we're thrilled that the panelists are here today and the students uh, have your bios. So for the sake of time, I won't read your bios out loud. But if you could start by briefly introducing yourself with where you're working now, uh, what your major was, and perhaps what house you lived in, that would be a great start. And I'll go in alphabetical order. Um, so Allison, would you like to begin? Sure. So I currently work at Deloitte Consulting in their government and public sector practice in the Washington DC area. And I lived, I was a government and Spanish double major and lived in Emerson. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, who would like to go? Oh, my list. Amani? Yes. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. So currently an entrepreneur. Uh, running my own consulting and coaching practice. I was formerly at Local Initiative Support Corporation, which is the largest community development intermediary in the country. And I majored in social psychology and minored in Portuguese Brazilian studies and lived in Sessions House for my last year. I hopped around all four years. Great, great. And Layla? Hi, everyone. I'm Lila Plamondon. I'm in New York City. Um, I work at Uncommon Schools, which is a charter management organization, and I do tech for them. So basically, I lead a technology team within a charter uh, management organization. I um, was a psychology major and a music minor, and I lived mostly in sessions except for my last year. So Imani and I did not overlap when I moved to Gillette. <laughs> And Sydney? Hi there, I'm Sydney. I've worked at Google for the last eight years in Mountain View, California. Um, I lived in Comstock and I was a government major specializing in like Middle Eastern studies. Great, great. And Shade? Hi everyone, it's a pleasure to spend some time with you. Uh, I work for a place called ISS Corporate Solutions. Um, 
They focus on uh, corporate accountability. So I advise companies on their best practices with regard to their corporate governance and executive compensation. Um, I graduated in 08 and at Smith I studied psychology and economics and I lived in Scales House all four years. Okay, wonderful. So you all uh, graduated in 2008 during a really difficult recession, financial crisis. Can you talk to us a little bit about how you're all think, uh, how you're all feeling, what you were thinking about um, the overall employment landscape? Allison, would you like to begin? Sure. So to be honest, while we were in college, I had no idea it was coming. The recession really hit August, September. So you're like, oh, I'm a senior at Smith. I'll be fine. I'll get a good job. And I was getting a lot of career advice from the same people being like, yeah, take the summer off. We'll be fine. Um, so, I mean, there was some chatter of a recession, but you were like, oh, that happens. Um, but there was no hint that it was going to be the biggest economic disruption since the Great Depression. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amani? Yeah, so similar to what Allison said, had no idea that it was going to be <laughs> as bad as it was. Um, I actually, for me, it was more of like the personal things that were leading up to graduation. So, and it, I should have taken it as a sign. So first my mother was laid off like a few months before graduation. And then unfortunately a close friend of mine was murdered like the week before senior ball. Um, so all of those things compounded by the time that we graduated, I was dealing with that. And then this, you know, this change in the economic landscape that then made it that much more difficult. But while at Smith, didn't really have an idea that it was going to impact me in the way that it did. I would just add that even right after graduating, I don't think it was clear, at least to me, what the impacts were. Like we were just finding our way and trying to get to that next job, trying to get the skills that we needed. It was only a couple of years later when I talked to a Smith alumna who was three years ahead of me. And she said, yeah, when we graduated, we all took a year off because we knew we'd get such a high paying job when we came back that we'd be able to repay all our loans and be just fine. So we all went traveling for a whole year. And to me, that blew my mind because none of us were doing that. We were looking for jobs immediately and like worried about what we potentially would find or not find. And so it was just, in a way it was good that I didn't know that was different because all of my peers and I were in this together and we were all doing similar things and it didn't feel, it felt like just what was normal for us. But feel free to disagree with other panelists. <laughs> No, I'm so glad that everyone's saying this because when I got this email, I, I was like, I don't really remember thinking about the recession that much. And I was a government major, so I should have known uh, what that meant. And I remember I was watching CNN. We used to watch the news. Um, I was watching CNN like compulsively because there was an election coming up. Um, but I also don't remember thinking that that would affect me a ton um, when it was happening. And I had to look up the other day when it actually got bad. And similar to Allison, I think. I kind of missed it with my timeline. Um, I had actually already started applying, I think, before things got kind of bad. Um, but yeah, I, I just remember not thinking that it was going to be that big of a deal. Um, but I do think we had much less of a like physical presence or disruption that you all are experiencing. Um, and just calling out the elephant in the room, I just, I'm sure I speak on behalf of all alumni who spent our senior year on campus, um, that we feel really badly that this is being disrupted for you and that you won't get to have all of the events that we all hold so dear, but I hope that you'll be able to pivot um, and this will ultimately make you way stronger, but we're all thinking of you a ton. Yeah, that's great. Agreed, I think resilience is a, a term we can all really share in 08 and 2020, so. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, I think I would agree with the other panelists that I didn't, uh, I didn't think I, I got a sense really of how badly um, things were taking shape. You know, in your senior year, I, think it's so nice. I need to finish my classes and finals and I'm applying for jobs or maybe I'm applying for grad school. So you're just kind of getting yourself to the end of the year. And yes, I think um, I, I personally didn't secure a job directly after graduation. So my plans, and fortunately, I had the safety net of my parents that I could go home to Texas and apply for jobs from there. But, you know, even at that time, I was, I was worried about finding a job, but didn't really know necessarily what was coming. 
And Shada, don't you, I think resilience is such a good word. And don't you think that resilience has served you well in the last, in like in the next nine, 10 years to come? Like we, you know, we had to be resilient right after. And, but that's such a great skill to have persistence and resilience. Absolutely. Yeah. I would say that's probably the theme for, for class of 08 and 09 that we'll, we'll now share with you all. So they don't call us the great 08 for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. So let's talk a little bit about what happened next. Um, Sydney, I'm going to target this question towards you. Can, you. can you talk to us a little bit about your first step after Smith and how that came to be in 2008? Sure. And I will couch all of this by saying that, like, I really didn't know what I wanted to do, especially long term. And that is probably still true. So I hope that helps for people who feel a little bit up in the air. And, and that was really because I felt so prepared and interested in a lot of things leaving Smith. Um, so I knew that I wanted to do public service. Um, and I actually had my application ready to go for the Peace Corps. I was interning that summer before my senior year in DC. And I went to like a reception for Congress people who had done um, the Peace Corps. And during a Q&A, somebody said, um, well, I heard you can't ever join like the intelligence community if you've done the Peace Corps. And I remember thinking like, what a silly question. And the answer was, you can't really. Um, there's a lot of parts of the intelligence community that you can't join after you've done the Peace Corps, um, including the CIA. And at that point, this is like so silly to say, I really thought I was studying Homeland Security a lot. I thought like, maybe I might want to do that one day. And I probably don't want to at this point, like sort of make that not an option. Um, so I was kind of thrown by that. I really thought I would do Peace Corps. Looking back, super glad I didn't do Peace Corps. That would not have been a good fit for me at all. Um, I think it's an amazing organization, but just would not have been uh, the right thing for me. And also, I don't know what I was thinking, thinking that I would join the intelligence community one day. I would have been like the world's worst spy of all time. So again, I really was kind of like all over the place about what I wanted to do. Um, and it's worked out pretty well. Um, so I started looking at sort of domestic things I could do in public service. And Teach for America was really like at its heyday. And it tends to do well when there's a recession. Um, so I applied to Teach for America in August um, and heard back in October. Uh, I still wanted to go somewhere that was sort of different. And so I had grown up in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, so I thought, I've never been to the South. I'm going to apply to teach in the South. So I asked to go to uh, rural Mississippi to teach high school. And I ended up getting a return offer to teach elementary school uh, at the district where I'd gone to elementary school um, and where my mom had been a 37-year veteran teacher. Um, and that really threw me because I, I, the whole time I had put in my application, I thought the interview, interview went well. Um, and I thought like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to be teaching in Mississippi. And so when I got that answer back, um, I really had to do some soul searching. My immediate response honestly was like, I don't even like little kids. Um, and so I was really thrown, but decided to ultimately do it. And I'm so glad I did because uh, it was such a great fit. And it turns out I love little kids. Fifth grade um, is where I ended up. And that is like my dream grade. It was such a great, perfect, perfect place for me to be um, to start my career. And yeah, it ended up being just the best possible way to jumpstart. Um, but at no point did it feel perfect at all when I, when I was going into it. I thought maybe I've made a huge mistake. Sydney, are you still there? Yeah, I think, okay, okay. I, I, yeah, that's sort of where it leaves off. Yeah, it's like, that's how I started. And I remember seeing like people uh, who I was colleagues with, like going to nice, or uh, who I had gone to Smith with, like going to nice dinners for work and things like that. And I was like, I'm trying to like dodge spitballs and counting tiny <laughs> math manipulatives with 37 students. Like this is not what I pictured, um, but it was really, what I needed and I think it was a really good fit and it turned out that um, I really liked education and I haven't left since. Right, amazing. Um, and Layla, can you, was your first step after Smith teaching in Mississippi as well or how, <laughs> what, what's the difference there? 
So I cast my net pretty wide. Um, like Sydney had no clue what I wanted to do and would also agree still there's like this level of what do I really want to do? So that doesn't disappear necessarily. But I started looking at in, uh, fellowships and that's something that I would encourage everyone to think about too. Like if your next step doesn't have to be a job. It could be um, some sort of service opportunity. It could be a fellowship as well. So I applied for a Fulbright um, and went to Toronto. The, one of the reasons was because I was really interested in identity development of Canadians and I'd been studying identity development. Another reason was my boyfriend was there at, the, at that point. Hilariously, we broke up right before I moved um, and then got back together right after I left Toronto. So that's also how life works. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so I would really encourage folks to look for fellowships and scholarships and think about that as part of what your next step could be. And then I thought maybe I wanted to be a singer. And so I moved to New York and accepted a part-time job at a um, school placement firm. And I did, it was a really small company, which was great because they let me do everything that I wanted to do. So if I was even remotely able, because they were so small, they're like, yeah, go for it, try it, see what happens. And I think if you're at a smaller place, you can really build those skills and people will give you opportunities to try and do as much as you want to do, which was really great for me. And that part-time job, I decided I, I, while I love singing, really didn't like the life of being a singer because I didn't want to go to jam sessions at 12 p.m., I mean 12 a.m. and like sing through the night. <laughs> so that part-time job turned into a full-time job. I did basically, I did a rotation at that small company in the sense that I did every job they had over the course of five years and only then did I realize I really love technology I really like leading teams and that's probably my specialty and I have some good communication skills and and that's been what has been true at Uncommon Schools I love technology I lead a team of eight I'm starting to teach leadership team building coaching skills within Uncommon and I facilitate a lot of communication and that's what my team is known for, strong communication because we do support. And so like it took five years for me to really figure out what my skills were. And if you had told me that I would be in technology when I was at Smith, I would have thought you were crazy. Like there was, I had no clue. I had no clue. So you still have, you have so much to learn about yourselves likely and the, your story is going to change so much and that's going to be so wonderful. Um, and so I think even though you're heading into maybe a, a funny time in terms of where the world is and the job market, there's still so much opportunity to learn about yourself and figure out what you really want to do. And in some ways, like if, if you get that knowledge in the next couple of years, probably will be, you know, the world will be in a good place and you'll be poised to take advantage of that. This is great. Um, Sydney and Lila, thank you so much for that. And I already, I have so many follow-up questions, but because of time, I'm going to keep it moving. But I'm just reminding everyone to uh, put their questions in the chat. Um, just to kind of remind yourself if you have any at this point to plug those in there. So now I'm going to um, switch gears a little bit and um, throw this question over to Allison. Um, in, in 2008, as a graduating senior, um, is there a time that you can recall where you had this pivot moment where you said, you know, I really need to learn a new skill or think about something really different because the, um, the career path I had in mind is no longer an option. So can you talk to us a little bit about um, any form of adapting to what was going on? Sure. <laughs> okay, so let's see. So, um... And it's okay if I like zoom out a little how the others did to just give some context to sure. my career. Yeah, so I graduated being like, okay, I'm going to do international affairs, international development, and I ended up doing that. Um, but similar to Amani, I kind of had some personal tragedy going on. So two weeks before my senior year at Smith, I found out my mom had terminal cancer. So also, um, so I graduated, was dealing with that, dealing with the recession. And so, and like going abroad wasn't really a thoughtful option for my mother <laughs> going to the other side of the world while she was dying. So I had to adapt and take some jobs uh, domestically. And so at that point, so I kind of had like two tracks going. I had my like, how do I pay my rent track? And then I had my, how do I build my resume and career track? And the resume career thing was like, 
me staying true to myself, me continuing the work that I was really passionate about at Smith. But um, given that, so my mom was in Ohio and I moved in with my childhood best friend in New York City. And my parents were like, oh, that's funny. You think you're going to like work for some NGO for free while living in New York City? You're cut off. And they gave me like two weeks notice. And so I had to hurry up and get a job. <laughs> and so I got that job and two weeks later, the stock market crashed. Um, so my first two jobs out of college did not have to do with international affairs. If, you, if I could summarize them, it was junk mail and janitors. I'm not kidding. Like I worked for the Tribune company. So like Chicago Tribune, when you open the newspaper and got Verizon ads, I was the one who made that happen for 150 newspapers. And then I was a paralegal for New York City's janitor union. Um, and, then, and then my mom passed away. And then I applied for a Fulbright to Brazil, got it, and then was able to um, build my international affairs career. And then while I was doing those day jobs, I was also um, helping to build an NGO that was working in Africa. And then I was doing a startup. So I was kind of working 80 hour weeks, which was really bad and unhealthy. And I'm probably still paying for it age 34. Um, but there was a lot of passion. And so adapting. So yeah, I mean, I would have to go to this high stakes stage. I mean, like if I, if I mess something up at the Tribune thing, it was a big deal. It was a $40 million project. So I had to make myself care about Excel and get really good at it. <laughs> I had to be like an organization expert. And so, I mean, I think with all of those things, so like, what are the skills? So with each of these day jobs, like, and you'll realize like Microsoft office, it sounds so silly, but like, PowerPoint, Excel, Word. So even if you get a job that's something you don't care about, like you're still getting those skills and those will carry you in any job. And the thing is, is that the world is so interconnected that anything you do will end up serving you, even if it doesn't think it will. Like I was a labor law paralegal and then when I joined consulting, we were doing a project where there was a massive labor law thing. So I became like the labor law person because I had that background and also consulting Excel. So everything I did at Tribune with Excel was like, I was able to just like hit the ground running. Um, so like hard work never goes to waste and there's no shame in having a few year detour. Um, but like I had my North star and I stuck to it, but I also think being really rigid and putting a lot of pressure on myself and defining success in a really narrow way out of college caused me a lot of angst. And I would encourage you to be open-minded and flexible. So sort of following up on, um, what Allison is saying, do any of the any of you all have other suggestions for um, transferable skills or skills that you really think that seniors or all students just sort of skill kind of um, skill up into at this time while they're while they're looking for a position? Are there skills that people can take advantage of through free uh, Coursera workshops or things like that that, that you feel? based on your industry expertise will be very transferable to a variety of different positions. I'll just uh, echo Allison in saying that all the Microsoft products, knowing Outlook, Word, Excel, it sounds so simple, but understanding how they work <clears throat> is really helpful. Teams is now a big deal on some places. But in my office, we use Google products. <laughs> and so um, really knowing how docs, slides, how to share. And then <clears throat> if you can master sheets and uh, analysis on sheets, I've found that no matter where I've been, if there's any kind of data involved, understanding even at the most basic level how to use sheets in a way where you can manipulate and analyze some data and then share it with your colleagues at whatever level you're at, is so helpful and it stays helpful throughout your entire career because you can take that first stab at looking at data in a way that everyone appreciates. And so maybe there are other data people who look more deeply, but if you can just understand how to use sheets and share sheets, um, it's super helpful. I would definitely echo that, um, that you're all very lucky coming from Smith um, or fortunate coming from Smith because a lot of us on campus organize clubs and events and you will realize that that gives you excellent program management skills, communication skills, organization skills that come in handy at a lot of places. I think what I was missing um, 
it, you know, through internships and things, you get experience maybe writing memos or doing some sort of Excel, but really digging into some of the um, program management and some of the technical skills, I think definitely of Excel or Sheets. Um, every job now, uh, even if you're not involved in technology, a lot of it has to do with data and what you can do with data. And so um, if you can just brush up on some of the more basic skills of that, especially if you haven't had experience. Um, I will say I recently pivoted to a new role and I did take a Coursera course in program management, just like Gantt charts and Agile versus Waterfall, which is all sorts of different planning. I don't think that would hurt anyone um, to learn. It's just how to make teams run. Um, so if you have some extra time, and that's definitely what I was thinking of when I was preparing for this panel, it's like, I think this is a good time to think about all of the things that interest you and then all of the possible paths that you could take. Um, and never before have we had more at our fingertips of being able to um, brush up at home. And so I know you're trying to finish classes online and, and keep in touch with people online. Um, but if you have extra time, I don't think it's a mistake to also start looking at those skills and, and there's plenty of online resources. Great, thank you. So my next question is, at any point, did any of you take a job because it was just a job and you needed it and you needed it to get your foot in the door and gain some experience? And what unforeseen opportunities or benefits came from this experience? Uh, Imani, you wanna give this one a go? Sure, um, and then to just um, add on to the, the previous question, uh, since I minored in Portuguese Brazilian studies, when I came back home to New York, it wasn't a large Portuguese speaking population. So I would just really encourage those that are language enthusiasts or, you know, studying language right now to continue to practice uh, because that may be of benefit for other opportunities that may be requiring someone who's bilingual or trilingual. Uh, so <laughs> with that, uh, to your question about like taking a job, um, it took over a year for maybe like a year and a half for me to actually find full-time employment. I actually started volunteering uh, for a small nonprofit that um, Jerry Seinfeld's wife actually uh, started. Um, it, then it was called Baby Bucky, but I believe now it's called Good Foundation. And it was a small team, programs team. And of course, you know, similar to like what Allison was talking about, like, I needed to make money and also, you know, support uh, my household as my mother was unemployed. So I negotiated with the program director to pay for my travel. Um, and, you know, so I was volunteering and interning there, but had uh, my commuting costs covered. So that helped. And we were in an agreement that that was kind of a bridge opportunity for me as I was actively looking for employment. So a connection with another panelist, um, Layla, who's currently at Uncommon Schools, my first full-time opportunity was actually for one of Uncommon Schools schools <laughs> that was starting out and uh, in Brownsville, Brooklyn. And um, while the title wasn't fancy at that time, it's just like, okay, I'm a, you know, I went to Smith and the title was office manager. Um, the thing that drew me is that when I was at Smith, you know, Teach for America was recruiting. There was all of these like education organizations that were recruiting and I didn't want to teach in the traditional sense, but I had saw that there had been a wave of education reform um, and, and that movement happening in the New England area and also New York. So I wanted to just learn more about that. And it gave me the opportunity to learn more skills about operations beyond the title. So definitely don't get caught up in the title that you are hired to do really focus on what is the skill that I am learning. Um, I was a part of a team that was small and mighty. It just had the director, myself, and a special projects coordinator. And we were helping build a, an, an entire school that was serving middle school students. Um, and it was full on startup. I was working off of a cardboard box. Uh, we didn't even not even have furniture there. Um, so anything you can think about, like building a school, that's what we were doing. Um, so I learned a lot of um, skills around just um, grit and entrepreneurialism that has really, really fueled me uh, throughout my career and also inspired me to be in spaces of entrepreneurship and also innovation. 
And can I just make an uncommon schools plug? We have 54 schools and we're still growing. Each of our schools has an office manager. I do a lot of work supporting office managers and teaching them probably way different than when Imani was there because we're larger and hopefully better. Mm -hmm. uh, but as an office manager, you learn so much, right? And, I left, and that's really a place where you can do as much as you are capable because they are lean. And, and so if you can run, man, they want you to run. Great. Thank you. Um, Today, I'll, I'll give this question to you. Um, given that you found a position during the recession, what's your advice to job search uh, strategies now for seniors? Um, what's different about it now than, than then, um, than when you graduated? And um, given your industry expertise, if there's anything you wanna share around what people should know now for the job search? Uh, sure thing. I did want to make a quick comment, I think kind of echoing what a lot of the other panelists have said and that I think one thing I've learned is that careers don't have to be completely linear. You don't have to sort of land your career role or your dream job right after graduation. So finding the right fields or work environment, it's, it's almost, it's, it's not so different from figuring out what your major is going to be, right? Sometimes you kind of, you don't know all the details, but you kind of figure it out by pursuing the things that you enjoy and that you can add value to. And then you kind of refine from there. You make note of the things that you don't really want to do and try to move more toward the things that you do like to do. So it's, it's, I really think it's very akin to kind of choosing your major in a way. And I think the important thing when you reflect at least for me, when I've reflected on my career is to think about not necessarily what brand have I worked for or what title have I had, but more like what is the, the story that my career path has been telling? What's the, what are the skills and experiences I've curated? You know, how have I sort of thought about my career path and what skills am I curating along the way? How can I be deliberate about kind of continuing to pick those up? How can I best tell my story, this story to employers? I think sometimes the the mosaic of a story can catch someone's eye more than sort of the, the clear traditional path toward a job. So I think, yeah, it doesn't always have to be um, very linear. But to, to your, to your um, question about um, sort of how things look differently now than they might have in 2008 when we were on the job market and what um, sort of tips, I guess maybe I've learned along the way. I think we've gotten some great tips already um, from the panel, but I think two, two observations I've made, I actually just started the job I'm in now three months ago. So I'm just coming off the job market myself. Um, and the biggest observation for me, one of them is that the recruitment process is a lot more automated. There's a, it's a lot less human. Um, and then there's a lot more sort of online networking going on. Um, so in terms of the automatedness of it, um, I think that can be challenging. I found it challenging to sort of customize my resume so that it could get scraped by some computer and then figure out that I'm great for this particular role. So I really, you know, I think making as many personal connections as you can will be very helpful. And I guess these days personal means at least electronic at the moment. Um, but try and, you know, try and get seen on LinkedIn if you don't have a LinkedIn account, or e even if you make a cold call or sort of write a cold message to someone. I spoke to someone two weeks ago I've never met before, but I was completely, you know, and I think people are generally kind and willing and interested to kind of talk to someone who's really trying to launch their career. So I would, I would not, um, I would encourage you not to hesitate to reach out to people. Uh, I think also finding local professional networks. I had an interest in sustainability, so I found my local net impact chapter. There's a women in sustainable investing chapter. So I tried to find, as I was coming out, you know, as I was just trying to find a place to plug in um, where there were already working professionals, some people recruiting um, at sort of networking events and things. Um, I think staying in the conversation is important. So if you're using social media, finding ways to use a platform like Twitter or LinkedIn to kind of demonstrate your continued knowledge and awareness of your discipline. So if, if you're not doing it already, maybe you consider posting an article once or twice a week on your LinkedIn or another social media account um, that's related to your field of study or the career that you're interested in. And then maybe progress from there if you're, you know, if you've got the time to write a blog post um, 
you know, or, and the idea is to really just stay in the conversation. So even if you're not in a job right away, there's a track record, there's something there visible for employers to see that, hey, this person actually isn't passionate about this or knowledgeable, has a point of view. Um, I think it's, it can be helpful to kind of share that and, um, and especially online. Um, and then say participating, I mean, I'm sort of preaching to the choir, but participating in the Smith Network, not just with um, alums or alums that are years out, but your peers, firstly, because it's really helpful to weather a challenging time with other people who understand exactly what you're going through. Um, so maybe find at least one person that you explicitly decide to weather the storm with. And then secondly, you know, at some point, you all be settling into your careers and that'll happen in all different times. And it's just helpful to know each other now in the future because you're no longer sort of classmates. These are, you know, your peers or your, your, your future industry colleagues and, and the people you'll be working with. Um, I agree with the point of taking the time to learn a new skill. And if you don't know where to start, one thing I've done is looked at dream workplaces or dream job descriptions and looked at what the skills were that they were they were seeking, um, whether it was Excel or maybe some of it was data analysis. And so my last job hunt, I actually went on to, I'm forgetting what the data, the website's called, I can follow up with it. I think it's data.io, but I was teaching myself R just to get better at learning to do some data analysis. It's a free software online that you can learn how to use. So, you know, there's it, it just, just looking at the job description for the job that you want to have, um, even if you can't get it now or you're not prepared necessarily for it now, um, could be really useful. And then just, I guess, lastly, on a, on a personal note, I would say surround yourself with people who care for you and who know you well. I think it can be hard to market yourself when you're experiencing rejection or you're getting radio silence from the other end of all these applications. You're just generally feeling down. These people, I think, will, they're just important because they remind you of what your strengths are. And that's, you know, you just kind of need those reminders. Yeah. This is awesome advice. This is great. So um, I'm sure the students are chomping at the bit to ask you all questions. So I have one final question before we'll open it up to student questions. And that's, um, what are you all most grateful for as part of the graduating class of 2008? Um, Allison, would you like to start? Sure, yeah, like that phrase, like New York, New York, if I can make it there, I can make it anywhere. If you can make it during this time, like three years from now, you'll be like <laughs> sitting pretty. And I also think it gives you a sense of perspective um, that like, you know, like they're just people who can get really been out of shape about small things. But when you live through something this major, and that's your kind of basis point for everything else, it helps you keep things in perspective. So um, if you can pull it off now, you'll be set for life. And it'll also give you good perspective, which is really invaluable. Great. Amani? Yeah, so I would say um, it really helped to have like a very close network of friends that as we, as I was experiencing what I was experiencing, we were all kind of going through similar uh, things, whether it was like personal or professional, it helped to not be alone. Um, so I definitely want to strongly encourage, um, you know, the, the graduating class to really tap into resources for just like wellness, mental health, spiritual health. It's going to be very, very important during this time. I definitely don't want you to walk away from this thinking like, oh, well, you know, they're doing so great. It's all going to be great all the time. It's going to be a journey for sure. And you're going to need to have a support network and resources to make sure that you're able to get through. Uh, for me personally, like I had entered a bout of depression that I had never faced before in my life. And it was actually the encouragement of my grandmother who passed away a month after I graduated um, that actually like she instilled great like faith values and, and prayer into me. So that is what helped me get through. Um, so I really want to encourage everyone to um, tap into your network, but then also external resources to really support you during this time. Great. I'll build on that and say, Imani, uh, thanks for bringing like the friendship and, and peers your own age. What I was most grateful for in addition to my like same age peers was the Smith Network. And I made relationships with a couple of alumni who were 
10, 15, 20 years ahead of me. And they have been my sort of guide, especially in times when I'm not sure what to do, having a call with someone who has some perspective and experience. Because I think a lot of time when you like attend panels like this or listen to podcasts, people tell you the great parts of what happened and what they did, which we certainly did also, but parts of it were really shitty and felt really hard. And it's really nice to be able to get on the phone with someone and say, ah, no, we, we, we went through that too. Like, it is hard. It is bad. It's okay. You're going to get through it. It's not, it's not all going to feel perfect. And I've never gotten a job without a Smithy being involved. <laughs> all major decisions in my life, there was some sort of like Smithy network where I um, was able to bounce ideas. And so I would really encourage you to find in, within the Smith ne network, even reaching out to someone from the class of from our class and saying, we're going through a difficult time and you did too, would you be willing to talk to me? Like 90% of those ladies, if you called me, I would say, yes, 100%, what can I do for you? How often would you like to chat? Um, so definitely reach out to your Smith, um, Smith ladies, Smith network people. Great. Sydney? Yeah, I would echo a lot of this. This was an amazing panel. I feel like I've gotten a recharge um, in my own career. So it's really, whenever you're around Smithies, you're like, wow, no wonder we're in good company. Um, I think I would echo that the time right after college is tough under the best of circumstances. Um, you spent four years carving out a niche that is probably really specific and you feel really good about. And then all of a sudden you are starting over again. Um, and that feels like a bit of an intimidating blank canvas. Um, and I would say like to what Ali said about not defining success really narrowly or feeling like the next thing has to be the exact right thing for your long term. No one knows what's going to happen next. And so whatever you cobble together, um, I think, you know, you're going to be um, having to be really creative because of the time. So, but I think that's for the best, like, constraining times breed a lot of creativity um, and a lot of scrappiness and that is really good to bring forward with you throughout the rest of your career. Um, so that's kind of like the time period we're in that I think is really unique and um, second I would definitely say like what I was most grateful for like bringing with me from Smith was the networking. Um, I really felt like I was collaborative with my peers and alumni, trying to figure out next steps versus being competitive. I really felt like a lot of people were trying to help me and look for connections and I was doing the same. Um, I used a lot of that network and right now I feel like I'm just starting to shift where I get to pay it forward and that feels amazing. Um, so I just think that network has just proved to be so, so unique. Um, I wrote my final check for my Smith loans a year ago, and it was the best money I've ever paid, um, and definitely had the most value and the most worth. Um, and totally coincidentally today, I'm sitting on this panel, um, then I'm talking to a prospective student who's trying to make up her mind, who I got introduced to through work, and I'm having a one-on-one -on -one with um, uh, a woman that we were in the same house at Smith and now we've worked at Google together and we have regular check-ins because we both have toddlers. So just the community continues um, and it's really, really strong. And I think we're all gonna be better eventually because of this time and because of what we share. Awesome. And today. Um, wow, I, I mean, I think those were all really great reflections. I think the only thing, uh, I, I think I can only echo what everyone has said and that's, you know, the, the skills that you end up getting through a season like this are kind of the intangibles. You know, you come out of Smith and you're a great writer and there's so many, you know, great skills that you've learned from Smith, but through this you learn the grit, you learn the resilience, you learn how to be, you know, you learn the ingenuity, you learn how to be entrepreneurial. So I think there's a lot to look forward to in terms of the, the intangibles um, of, of kind of plotting your career moving forward. Yeah, I'll just add a, an African proverb quote that gets me through hard times that's relevant is that uh, smooth ships don't make skillful sailors. So, yeah. Wonderful. Well, this is, this is amazing content. Thank you all for being so real with your answers. And um, Kate, what are you hearing in, in the chat? Thanks, Patty. So we have a follow-up question um, with the idea around, um, so Sydney talked about getting into Teach for America and really thinking about the service sector being available at a time um, 
uh, of uncertain times. Did anyone else sort of think about anticipating um, certain sectors as you were looking that might be more available? Yeah, so I, um, I actually considered AmeriCorps, uh, but it's like I wasn't seeing anything local. Now, in my former role in the organization that I was at, a local initiative support corporation has a national AmeriCorps program. So I would even encourage people to look into national service. Um, you know, Sydney was talking about Peace Corps, which, which is international, but AmeriCorps is domestic. And um, there's a ton of nonprofit organizations that are already strapped for resources right now and could really use and utilize the um, direct human capacity that you would lend to, to serving. So um, I would put a plug in for AmeriCorps. Um, I'll say the federal government sector hasn't stopped. So I work in federal consulting. So you can think about it either as getting a job directly with the government. That would be the hardest to break into. But I would encourage people to look into government contra um, consulting and contracting. They're pretty much the same thing. But there will be like a ton of companies on LinkedIn that you've never heard of that do really cool work at government agencies. And if you could break into one of those, there's probably going to be more job stability in that than something that is commercially fo commercially focused. And that's just what I'm seeing in my day to day and how my company's operating also. Thanks. We have a question from um, an international student. And so specifically from that perspective, a student who has a limited time um, in the States to secure something, um, what suggestions do you have to sort of navigate that and be proactive? I can take a stab at that. I was not officially an international student, but grew up in Bangladesh and have a lot of international students. And I think the key thing is to, I think you really got to put all your feelers out there, make all your contacts and sort of do that work a little bit, maybe more quickly than some of your peers because you are time bound, but it's very possible. And, and uh, like reach out to reach out to as many people as you can, as many Smithies as you can to see what the options are that are available. And then of course you're looking at the larger companies that are going to be able to grant visas in the longer term. And so that can get a little trickier because your options are just limited. You can't be looking at places where they're not going to help you with visas usually past that first year, I believe. So I, I would say it's, I wouldn't lose hope just because of the visa situation. I would just say, you know, start fast and, and put, put it all out there and see what you can catch. Yeah, and I'll say that on the networking front, I mean, we're all in the same boat. <laughs> so if you reach out to somebody on LinkedIn and you have a completely only virtual relationship, like that's how it's operating for those of us who aren't graduating seniors. So I would treat networking as you would even if we weren't in a COVID situation. And if you want to be really intense, you could like give yourself a quota, like make an Excel sheet, put people on a list, say, I'm going to reach out to three people a day, set up a 15 minute call at the end of the call, ask them if they have three more people for you to talk to, establish rapport, slip it in there, you have a visa thing. And then like, yeah. Um, and just uh, be really determined and proactive, but don't come across too pushy, <laughs> despite all of that. Um, yeah, and start with the Smith thing and then expand out from there. You, you don't have to, but you'll probably have a higher success rate reaching out to Smithies than just cold people on LinkedIn. However, recruiters are okay with that. So I, it's still really awkward, but if somebody has the title recruiter, like you can reach out to them without them thinking you're weird <laughs> or really aggressive. They're okay with it. Speaking as a former recruiter, go for it. Definitely. Cool. Good. I can't bring myself to do it yet, but I know people do. <laughs> I did get, when I was recruiting, I would have a lot of people say like, oh, I actually got an email from you two months ago, but I didn't respond because I thought you were a robot, like yeah. not a robot at all. Um, and so, yeah, I would say like follow up on any and all leads um, and 
you know, really kind of have your hustle like ready to go. And that, that goes for everybody. Like you should have a cover letter that sort of is the bones of what you can easily plug things in. You should have a resume that's totally up to date. Um, and I think you should have like a one to two minute pitch about who you are, your past experiences, what you're passionate about doing. So think of everything that you've done at Smith and like what, including your major, are you really good at and what can you kind of showcase and then have like a succinct way you can pitch that to people um, in these conversations. The only thing that I would add, and, and again, this is um, not just advice for the student who asked the question, but for anyone, um, is it's fine to schedule like one-on-one -on -one chats, but I would try to do some research to have an agenda um, to ask more specific questions. Oh, yeah. Um, I kind of dread like an ambiguous conversation, but I really like like when a student comes and they say like, I did some research. It looks like there is this open role. Do you think that like my, I'm qualified for that? Um, just to kind of get us started, I think is really nice. So just do your homework a little bit before you walk into those conversations. That's I can't so right, Sydney, for any, for any conversation, anytime you reach out to someone, have like three or four solid questions. Yeah, the yeah, big, they, like, they, oh, can I talk to you about life and whatever? You're like, girl, I don't got time for this. What do you need from me? Like, just tell me. It's fine. Yeah, I'd rather I'll help you. you about being pushy, but I'd rather have, like, a direct ask. Um, yeah. Even if I kind of have to, like, it's hard with job descriptions because they're so obtuse sometimes. You're like, is this, like, a VP or is this, like, entry level? And so I'd rather even have, like, a jumping off point where I can say, like, actually, like, you would be a better fit for this. Um, yeah. But something yeah. to start the conversation and have it be pretty driven and this is also like a silly thing but I would ask people for a 20 minute conversation during th versus 30 minutes right yeah, now definitely. all of our working days are divided into 30 minute or one hour like meetings and that means like I can't use the bathroom or grab coffee so but 20 minutes for some reason just sounds mm -hmm. like so much more feasible um so I would definitely say like hey could I chat with you for 20 minutes these are kind of the things I have in mind I looked up to this job description and I was hoping I was a good fit then I would go into that like yeah this person like yeah. knows what's up yeah that 15 to 20 minute thing because your thing's only to get on their radar and let them know you exist not to like convince you to be their best friend um and then going back to the elevator pitch one thing I do is on that um photo booth thing on the Mac computer I would record myself <laughs> and I know like you should go like one minute max if you can get it down to 30 seconds. But I was going like two and a half minutes. I was like looking all over. I was like getting really emotional. Like, no, it doesn't matter. Like, and then and like to say who you are and then end it with like where you plan to go. And the, if you can have a really solid elevator pitch going like into this phase of your life, that's 30 seconds to a minute. Like, you'll that's half the battle because then you could say it at the beginning of job interviews you say it at the beginning of all these networking calls and um and it's a really good skill to have to, to be able to do that. Ever fly on airplanes again or go to sh coffee shops you'd be surprised how often you run into people and you're like this is who I am um which mm -hmm. is really good to have that ready to go. Yeah that's it's like essential it's up there with the cover letter and resume mm -hmm. and then follow up right because like so many people are willing to help you and and they have life and toddlers like Sydney and I, like partners, whatever going on, doesn't mean that they don't want to help. So don't be afraid to follow up, follow up, follow up, follow up. For sure. I'll have to say, they're just different Go types ahead. of personalities and you have to follow up with me like three times. Not because I don't want to help you, but because I hate email. So like, it just, it's a thing. I will say it's definitely my pet peeve when we've gotten as far as having like a conversation and we agree on next steps and then those next steps take a long time. Um, I think anyone who's trying to help you it's just the nature of the beast that they lose a little bit of interest. And so really showing like an immediate hustle with like, hey, thanks for hopping on to talk today. Um, here's, you know, the cover letter you requested and resume. Let me know how else I can be helpful. Um, just that follow, closing that loop is so important. I've had so many people who I refer and their referral expires um, or they don't follow up with me on the next step. And it feels like kind of a time sink. And later when I catch up with them, they're like, oh, I was just just, I never got my cover letter like perfect. It's like a cover letter that has a typo or is maybe not perfect, but is on time and we can put you in for an opportunity is way better. So like, please don't let um, perfection be the enemy of the good and really have that hustle for following up and closing the loop with people. Yeah. 
This is amazing, guys, uh, ladies, I should say. We have about two or three minutes left. Um, is there a, uh, just, uh, and I apologize for cutting you off, Allison. Um, is there, a, is there a, a, a short final question, um, Kate, that, that the panelists might be able to uh, quickly answer? There was a follow-up question about um, negotiating while volunteering. So I think Amani, maybe that um, is what sparked it. If anybody else has sort of gotten their foot in the door and has any negotiating tips on how to um, move up or get what you want. I definitely would say I had a very transparent conversation uh, when I find when I found the volunteer opportunity. It was you know it was unpaid. Um, I negotiated that this could be you know this could count as internship experience, like credible work experience, and said you know I, I understand that this is you know the market that I'm entering in, but what is it that is within the budget that would you know accommodate me bringing skills to this organization. So transparency is key. You know, you, you're already being flexible enough to, um, to support through volunteerism that is unpaid. So being as transparent as possible, whether it's, you know, uh, a recommendation that you're really desiring from this organization, whether it's a particular project or skill that you're hoping to gain during that time frame, be very, very upfront. So it's agreed upon early on, so there's no surprises. I would say negotiation in general is one of those skills that you can upskill on immediately. Find some blog posts, some books. I don't know if anyone has great podcasts, but like, it's so key to know how to negotiate. And it's often really hard to do that right when you have an offer or right when you need something to then go upskill. Definitely that's something you guys should start thinking about. And it's hard in, in this time period because you feel so grateful for anything that you're like, I should just take it. And it's like the question I most commonly get from women negotiating is they say like, what if I like make them mad and they rescind the offer? Like, that is not going to happen. So I loved when Imani said that because I was just like, yes, like nothing ventured, nothing gained. The worst thing that can happen is they can say like, listen, I will try to do that. And if we can, like we will, right? But just having a really frank conversation like she did about like, this is what I'm bringing. This is kind of what I could use. Like, do you you think that's possible like that's negotiation so I, I was so inspired by that and I think like what should be running through your head again and again is like nothing ventured nothing gained I need to ask for what I need and then I can reevaluate but you're not gonna make anybody upset no yeah. I when I hire especially when I hire young ladies when they start to negotiate I'm like yes I hired the right person yeah that's true and then I think also like the time bound thing like be like maybe like okay well like I'll volunteer for free in three months but in three like in three months can we revisit you know whether this is going to turn into a full-time position or and the other thing is you're not being compensated with money so like Amani said think about like how will you be compensated is it exposure is it getting a recommendation letter is it getting that brand on your resume and like like Think about what you need and be really explicit. And sometimes you don't need to tell them that's why you're doing it, like especially right up front. But like being a volunteer is valuable, even if it's not compensated. And it's also a really, really, really good way to just get skills and build your brand and build your network. Um, so I think a lot of Smithies can over volunteer, but like just, yeah, it's a fine balance. And I think in terms of employment, I, I think pretty much every sort of full-time permanent jobs, I think every employer expects you to negotiate. It's kind of, it's already expected and on the table. So you're, you're kind of just, yeah, you're, you're missing an opportunity if you're, if you're not doing so. I've never worked anywhere where I assumed, like, I just knew the employer was expecting me to negotiate in some way. Your male counterparts are certainly doing it. And they're applying when they don't need all the qualifications so they're going to be great for the job. So get in there. Well, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. It is just a little past one o'clock. And this panel has been um, amazing, uh, inspiring, um, tons of content learned here today. I can't thank you all enough. Um, this webinar will be or has been recorded and will be posted to the Lazarus Center website probably within a week. 
Um, we now will be um, shutting off, or I will stop the recording, and I invite anyone who is um, on the Zoom call now um, in, in a moment to uh, feel free to hang out for a little bit with our panelists, um, connect, learn how to connect with them online. And uh, thank you so much panelists and to all students out there and everyone to uh, stay optimistic, stay healthy, and um, thank you. Have a great weekend, everyone.